I am delighted to be here uh, with some of my favorite people, uh, leaders in business, philanthropy, and leading countries in ways that are progressing the thought about how we should interact as men and women together. And excited to be here at the FII 8 conference and this inaugural conversation with this uh, Horizon Summit. Um, we are gathered to explore, again, not only a topic that is near and dear to, to my heart, but crucial for the future of global economic development. Women's empowerment and economic inclusion and prosperity is central to the way we will move forward as humanity on this planet. And as our world becomes more increasingly reliant on technology, empowering individuals across all sectors, across all countries, and genders is essential for us to actually move ourselves forward as a, a, a people. First, I'm delighted to introduce Her Royal Highness Princess Rima Banda Al Saud. I haven't seen her on screen yet. Oh, there she is. Hello. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, the Ambassador to the United States from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Welcome. Her Highness has been a trailblazer in promoting women's rights and economic participation in Saudi Arabia in both the public and private sector, and we are Delighted to have her as a host for this wonderful conference in her beautiful country. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Cecilia Atias, who's a senior vice president of public affairs and board member at RANA. And throughout her career, Cecilia has been deeply involved in women's rights, fighting for progress on issues to domestic, uh, related to domestic violence, immigration, assimilation, and crimes against children. And finally, my dear friend Jenny Johnson one of the greatest executives I've ever had the privilege to see, work with, and to follow her career. She is a trailblazer. She is magnificent. She is the CEO of Franklin Templeton. That is an honor. Thank you. <laughs> it, is, it is the truth. <laughs> From a guy like this guy. Well, that's, 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 that's kind. One of the largest global investment managers with 1.6 trillion, that's with a T, right, Jenny? That is with a T. Uh, in assets under management. And she focuses on, uh, in addition to that, an, a great advocate for women in finance. So I look forward to a dynamic and insightful conversation. I would like to start with you, uh, if I can, your, your, your Highness. Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030, 2030 places a strong emphasis on women's empowerment and economic inclusion. Two questions. How do you see Saudi Arabia's progress in integrating more women into the workforce particularly in leadership roles, and what policies or investments have been most successful in accelerating this shift? Well, thank you for having me. I think it's really important today that we are having this conversation on the Horizon Summit oh, and involving okay. the voice of women as we launch uh, the FII. The Kingdom's progress since Vision 2030, to be honest, has been a, quite astounding. The biggest change I think that I could tell you has been made is the regulatory frameworks and the laws that have been implemented, which is what have allowed not just the government to push forward on the inclusion of women, but creates the framework for the private sector to understand their responsibilities, what needs to be done, but most critically, women today know what their rights are. Women today know what to ask for, and they have a path forward. I think if I could say there's one thing that I would love to keep working on, it's the mindset of not just a woman in a place of leadership, but the woman, because each woman is different, her skills are different, and her needs are different. And so having this conversation today for me is actually quite critical and important. When we talk about the accelerators uh, for the inclusion of women um, and what policies and investments have to be made, it's not just the policy on paper. It's the implementation, the follow through, and the creating of a space where the woman herself understands what propulsion she needs and then has the tools and the resources uh, to actually achieve that. Each of us here, I believe, had the right mentors, not always women, many times men. But how gorgeous and wonderful would it be if each of us could have said, she was my mentor or she was the one that propelled me. But the Horizon Summit's value, I think, today is what Richard said. He and she are both in the room together. And I think it's that com combination versus exclusively female that's going to create the environment that women thrive in and men thrive in because it's not us at the expense of them it's the collective that's important thank you that that's very well said and i'd like to pick up on a point if i can cecilia which is the important role of public and private partnership 
working together, where have you seen that successful and what are the things that we need to think about collectively to ensure that the public and the private sectors have an ability to advance women's needs, women's issues, and frankly, uh, women's inclusion into, into our societies? Yeah, I think it's a very important point and it depends on which part of the world we're talking about, but I, can, I have witnessed in Rwanda, for example, after the genocide, uh, the government tried to really make equity between men and women. And now 50% of the workforce in Rwanda are women. So we need to help to unlock those situations where women are hitting a uh, glass ceiling. And in Europe, in France or in Iceland, we're trying to put some quotas to uh, oblige the companies and the corporate companies to put on the board 30% of women. So it's complicated at the very beginning because we need to hire people for their talent and their skill and not because of their gender. But that's a way, I think, to uh, de-block a situation. That's what we're trying to do in France, that they're trying to do in Iceland. I have several countries that they're really working on and trying to implement those kind of uh, things. Great, thank, thank you. It, you know, Jenny, you run a global business. And it's been remarkable what you've been able to accomplish and build and, and, and ensure that women have a very prominent role in the organization. I would really love to hear what is it that you focus on in, internally as a policy objective, point one. And point two, you've now expanded your presence here in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. With uh, a female CEO. Absolutely. So we want to hear about the decision-making process, the support that, uh, that, that the kingdom has been giving you to ensure that you're able to meet your, not only your financial objectives, but your personal objectives and goals in making sure there's gender parity opportunities uh, for people in your company. You know, and just thinking about how to solve this problem, right, a problem of, of more inclusive capitalism for women, you know, w one piece of that is, okay, well, if your workforce has more women, then they're gonna be able to deploy capital and, and you know, potentially see opportunities. And because it's an opportunity, and it, you're, Robert, you're in my fund is always gonna be held up for how it performs. So we, we're not a charity, we have to invest for good returns. And you know, in the US, less than 2% of venture capital is actually given to women entrepreneurs, and yet they have twice the return of the average venture capital fund. Right? So if you're, if you're looking for an investment opportunity, you'd say, well, I better go find some women entrepreneurs. That's a great opportunity. Right. And yet 57% of the women turned down will say the VCs that they pitched to didn't understand their idea, mm -hmm. right? Because it might have been specific. And um, I can give a, kind of examples of, of where if you can't align with the vision, you may miss the investment opportunity. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the returns are there obviously shows that... Uh, that there's a great investment opportunity. So how do you get more women in? You know, one of the things that I've talked a lot about in the industry is I could go hire from my competitor and bring a woman over to Franklin Templeton, but I've done nothing to actually help the problem. Right. And so we've been very focused on saying, let's change the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And part of that, and I tell the story about my daughter who, when I asked if uh, my, any of my kids were gonna follow me into this business, my daughter said, no, mom, I wanna do something that helps people. And I realized what a poor job we were doing at describing what right. we do and helping people. Uh, and so if you look actually at the numbers, women tend to fall out in high school and definitely college as far as their interest in STEM and financial services. Mm -hmm. So you have to start to address the problem there. And so we've worked with some nonprofits. As a matter of fact, in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. we, uh, we've uh, just launched October 8th, the program with Princess Noor University where we already have 150 participants, where we're providing an investment certificate, mm -hmm. uh, we, educating women on actually why this is a great industry to join. And so the first phase is they go through an eight week course and learn things like portfolio construction, risk management, global markets investing. And then a portion of them, portion of them actually come in as interns. Because right. we think if they can spend some time in the office, they actually will start to see it as a career. Right. And that will change the pipeline. So critically important to build uh, public partnerships uh, with private companies, building on ramps of opportunity, yes. uh, and, and driving curriculum activities into those those on ramps. And and um, Princess, I, I I would love to hear a bit more of your thoughts about what we can do as private sector participants to enable the women in the in, in the kingdom uh, to also participate more effectively in 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 the world of finance and in the world of business. 
So to pick up on what Cecilia was saying and really to confirm my opinion of, of what the ladies have said, it really takes the investment of the private sector to put us together, yes, but we also need to look at not just exclusively what the kingdom can do, but what can the kingdom do to learn from others and how can our ladies be a conduit for the learnings that they have to other people. We're all in this together. We're all starting at different points. And I can give you an example of a program that um, the American Embassy and the Atlantic Council and our embassy have done, uh, Empower ME, which is bringing young women from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and collaborating with women from the United States of America to create that level of mentorship, engagement, exposure. There's all sorts of programs that take and connect people. And it can't be exclusive to one gender, first of all, even though we are in the Horizon Summit, because we learn from working in a mixed gender environment, but our women do need the attention and they do need the focus and they do need the exposure to help them level up. Um, and that's the type of programming that I think Jenny's talking about. Uh, mentorship, um, investment in uh, skill sets and skill development. And the program at Princess Noura University is one of the most exceptional ones because it's bringing women from the top level mid-level and engaging with our young women to say, yes, you want to be at the top, but this is how you get there. I think we forget how to build pipelines and we assume that women are entering in that same pipeline that men historically have had, and they haven't, particularly in the kingdom. It's not that it's new for women to be in the workplace, but there are so many new workplaces that women can be in that historically we weren't there. So the situation, the environment might not be equally as conducive to women as it was to men. So we do have to create the policies that create the incentives to push forward these women, engage private sector, and not just in sector. There are so many transferable skills that can happen. So yes, women in finance must learn finance, but there's communication skills, engagement skills, problem solving skills. We should be looking cross-sectoral in the types of trainings that we're doing to create a well-rounded woman in the workplace, mm -hmm. not a woman that is just singular in her specific chosen career. Um, and I think that the more we engage, and to, to Cecilia's point, with women from other countries, men from other countries, and learn and expose ourselves, the Saudi woman will be a woman that could work anywhere in the world, and that's the goal. It's not to have her be at the peak and the pinnacle exclusively in country. It's for her to be recognized for her excellence anywhere. And I think that's what many of the women in the United States have been able to achieve. Many of the women in France have been able to achieve. Mm -hmm. And I very much look forward to the Saudi woman being able to join her global sisters as a global employee, as a global leader. Cecilia, you have an audience of CEOs, not only in this room, uh, but, but as we're being broadcast and simulcast. What are the words that you'd like to say to them as to how they can create and open more opportunities for women, create an environment for them to build their skills, capabilities, mentorship dynamics? What, what are the, the, the two or three things that you have seen as barriers, but how can we as CEOs and executives in the private sector look to overcome those barriers to, to make a more inclusive on-ramp? There is one thing I would like to say. I've been around for a while and traveling a lot and uh, sitting in a lot of panels for women. I am surprised that we still have a panel for women. We should, I mean, be part of the other panels and not have to um, have those kind of difficulties in the modern world. I mean, we're in the 21st century. We should have the same opportunities than men. I have daughters, I have a son. I mean, their life might be the same. Right. Not because, not difference, no difference between genders. And it's very, I mean, surprising to still have those kinds of barriers or problems for women to thrive in this modern world. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy to be part of those panels, but we need really quickly to find a way in every kind of um, specificity to make life easy for women as for men. I mean, not only studies, but open all the companies and the boards to women and the skills should be the, 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 the specific choice, not the gender. And uh, I would like next year or in two years, three years from now, th to see that there is no more glass selling for women around the globe, I think. Yeah, I agree. I'll, I'll talk to the conf conference organizer about that. <laughs> But, but importantly, you know, when you think about the on-ramps, I know Jeannie and I have been involved in a number of organizations in the United States, uh, Girls Who Invest is, is, is one of them. 
but what are the activities that we as CEOs can drive forward to ensure that we are creating this, this on-ramp and enabling, as, as, as Princess Rima said, the change not only of the mindset of the, the people in, in control of those, those opportunities, but frankly enable the women to be their best selves in those environments and to find a place that they can feel is whole and healthy and, and supportive of their development. What are some of the specific ideas we can tell our CEOs in the audience? So one, one just point you, know, you made about that it, it's frustrating on the pace and I sometimes get frustrated about it, but I also remember, so my mother, who is now 88, uh, had seven children and then went back to college and gra graduated from Stanford Medical School. She was one of 10 women at the time to graduate. And, uh, and today, medical schools have more than 50% women. So, so you know, we, we are making progress, and yes. we have to just remember that. And it, it's a deliberate, and it feels slow, but we're making progress. You know, I think one of the most important things, Robert, just actually having you on this stage and sharing it with us, right, to show that and having a room that's basically 50% men, 50% women, to, I, I always say it doesn't matter what HR policies we have in the company if the senior male leadership doesn't actually act upon them. So I will encourage them to say openly to a group of uh, employees, hey, I'm leaving today because I need to take my I, you know, son to the doctor, or I'm leaving today because I'm going to coach my daughter's team, right? right? And if, if men speak up about those things, it normalizes it and makes it acceptable because the reality is women are, have a disproportionate amount of home duties, right. and so they will often juggle it. So yeah. if, you know, if it could be obvious that that's an acceptable behavior, I think that's really important. Right. The HR policies are important. Really understanding the numbers, looking at it, and asking yourselves, are we seeing promotions, you know, at all levels uh, that are equivalent? And if you, and, you know, the data doesn't lie. Uh, and so at least trying to understand doing things like exit interviews and others to really understand truly as a firm whether you're making positive progress and addressing issues as they come up. I think that's an important point. Um, you know, when I look, you know, we are a gender parity firm, my firm have been for quite some time. Uh, and as you state, you know, returns of organizations typically with more diversity, uh, gender, racial, et cetera, typically have lower risk, higher returns, lower beta. All those are important aspects of that. But it's important to build the inclusionary environment where it actually is, it normalizes family. It normalizes other priorities that we have. And women often take the brunt of some of the family rearing uh, uh, obligations uh, that can take from time at work. The beautiful thing is technology has enabled us to remain sure. more connected. If you think about the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the advancements they've made in just the last few years in that context, what suggestions would you have? And, and Princess, of course, uh, any, any elements that you would like to share uh, that we can drive forward as a organizing group uh, of executives and, and policy makers to ensure that the women of Saudi Arabia have more opportunities for skill development, uh, mentorship, and in many cases, internship uh, opportunities. So, um, Princess, maybe we'll start with you. What are the things that we can do to, to enable this country to accelerate those goals? So I have a few pieces of advice for you. I know in the kingdom we've created these quotas for you, of percentages of women that we'd like to see in senior leadership on your boards and... However, I would really implore you to do the due diligence and the research to hire the right woman, not just a woman. Because a woman might not have the skill that you specifically need, and she then actually creates a detrimental effect for the rise of the qualified women in your industry or in your business. The women that you're looking for do exist. You just need a little bit of time to look for them and find them. Um, you wouldn't just hire a man because he's a man, so don't just hire a woman because she's a woman, because that's honestly, it, it does us no service. The second advice I would give you is please focus on the pipeline of your middle management. The decision making at the top will never be the best decision if you don't hear the balance of a gendered um, opinion. The research, the way women look at things, the way we present things and propose things really does come from a different point of view or perspective than the male perspective. So you do want both of those points of view rising to the top for the decision maker to, write, to make the right decision. And it doesn't matter if that decision maker is male or female, it's the quality of the input and the substance of it that's critical and important. And in that mid-level pipeline, 
work there, expand there and create the opportunities there because the woman you're looking for, she'll rise from there. She'll rise from your culture and your company. She'll rise from being embraced and mentored and coached and understanding your line of work. So the rush for me is not to get the woman at the top. The rush for me, for you, is to get the breadth of women, to have the breadth of experience to rise and grow in your company. And I promise you they're there. They're waiting for you. Perhaps you're just not looking in the right places. And I'm happy to help anyone who's looking for the woman because we know each other. We find each other. We see each other. And so um, the middle pipeline, the balance of opinion, that's my real advice to you. Great, thank you. Cecilia, you have gone from public sector to private sector. Where are the areas that you would recommend to ensure that we have more trained, enabled women in both of those sectors? What are the suggestions or ideas that we should walk away with? Do you know women have three lives? They're working, they're, they're wives, and they're mothers. So I think that the public and the private sector have to work together to help them to embrace those three lives without being penalized because some meetings are late at night and it's the time where the kids are going out of school. There is a lot of work to be done. And I think in every domain the woman likes, she needs to be helped to realize her dreams and to be who she wants to be, not what she needs to be. And I think there is a lot of women, I've been in politics for almost 25 years, and women are very committed. But I have to say that most of them, they don't have a private life mm. because they don't have time. And they're supposed to travel a lot and they're supposed to be very much there. So, it, I mean, we need to help them to embrace the career they want to have and to help them to, for the, with the kids, to, with the, the life, the, the current life. And that's a real uh, effort that government and private sector have to do. And I've been living that for years and I've been trying to help those women to embrace their careers and to become what they want to become without, I mean, neglecting any kind of things or kids or any part of their lives. And I think there is a lot to be done, again, in this uh, sector. And, and Jenny, in support of, uh, call it a holistic life and raising children and family and working, uh, what are the aspects, I know that you em employ at your company, but what are the aspects that other CEOs need to consider uh, and embrace to ensure that women have the ability to, to raise families? Because typically they end up with, you know, there's a normalization of, of call it gender roles in some re respects, it's important. Yeah. But what are the things that companies can do to enable that to be more effective? Well, I think you um, touched on one of the things, which is just technology. The technology that's enabling greater flexibility actually plays to women's strengths a lot more. Um, and, and so having a bit of flexibility is important. I always say that, look, I want people to think of a job at Franklin Templeton as a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. In other words, sometimes your home life is going to take more from you and the company needs to be a little bit flexible with that. And sometimes the company is going to ask for more uh, and, and, and you're going to end up having to, the family has a little bit of a sacrifice from that. Uh, and if both respect the other's time and the need and recognition that, um, that that's what it's gonna look like. I mean, it used to be you went to work and home and it was like this, and now it's much more right. integrated. And again, technology enables that. Um, I think that's gonna help women. You know, things like the fact that you might be able to then start work after you put the kids down, right? That flexibility of sort of figuring out your day is going to play much more to women's strengths. Right. I think with a couple of minutes left, uh, maybe, well, Cecilia, you, you first. If you would, uh, what are the leave-behind comments that you would like to make sure that our, our audience uh, receives? And then, Jenny, if you would uh, as well, any other thoughts you want to make sure you emphasize? And then, uh, lastly, I think, uh, Your Highness, just really love to, again, thank you for welcoming us so graciously into your, your beautiful country. Uh, but any other last minute, last message you'd like to leave? So, Cecilia, first, please. I would like to leave a message to your country, Your Royal Highness. I mean, Saudi Arabia have been here coming for years, and the change for women has been so tremendous, so big, so huge, so fast, that I'm very proud to be uh, witnessing. And the first time I came here, it was like 12 years ago. I mean, women weren't allowed to drive by themselves. I mean, and now you can see in, work in all the offices I'm going to, or the workplaces I'm going to, I mean, women are everywhere. So it's a country which is really an example 
for the region, not only for the region, but for the world. We're going very fast, very quickly for, to help women to embrace their career and be whoever they want to be. Great. Tim? I'll just add, I, I brought my executive committee here a couple of years ago, and all, most of them are global investors, and the comment was, I have never seen the society advance so quickly for the benefit, mm -hmm. you know, and for the good of people as, as has happened here in the kingdom. So um, I put that out. And then the other thing I did say, acknowledge that we all have biases. Like, it's okay to acknowledge that. And right. just a quick story, when they were considering for me to be CEO, one of the board members asked, we were going to do an acquisition, you know, how do you feel about doing this acquisition? And then I said, I'm very excited about it. And I'm, you know, I think it's a difficult time in the industry, but I'm, you know, very motivated to do whatever. I walked out and my CFO goes, good answer, sounds really strong. And then I got a phone call that I created a gender divide on my board because the women liked my answer, but some of the men mm -hmm. felt I might not have been a team player because I didn't mention that I was excited to work with the with list it. of men right. on the executive committee. <laughs> and that was their own bias, right? right. We all have biases. Mm -hmm. uh, and so recognizing that that can inhibit and try to understand them. Right. That's a great point. And, and your highness, if you would, final comments uh, to the audience. I think the biggest comment that I could say is thank you. Thank you for coming to the kingdom. Thank you for seeing us and thank you for believing in this vision 2030 and continuously coming and giving us not just the feedback, but supporting us and extending your hand. Thank you for hiring us as women. Thank you for seeing our caliber and not minimizing our role. The women of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, we're not tokens. We're not by the bys, we're not a box to tick. We're women who are dedicated to the development, not just of our country, but of our families, of our nations, and our neighborhoods. And if we thrive, ladies and gentlemen, I promise you the women of the world thrive because we all deserve the path forward. We all deserve the dignity and the grace to develop and grow and engage and be ourselves and define ourselves. So I thank you for not trying to define us, but giving us the space to define ourselves and welcoming us into not just the workplace, but welcoming us into the world. I feel it's our time, but it's our time to collaborate with everyone, not to win at the expense of anyone else. And so, thank you. Wonderfully said. <laughs> so I would like to thank our distinguished panelists, and we will look forward to next year this saying, our horizon. <laughs> there summit. we go. Good. So, Excellent. Thank you. Noted. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you.